Voice Over Coffee Shop, Episode 2. Welcome to the Voice Over Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in voiceover. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there, my name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the Voice Over Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in voiceover. If you'd like to know more about me, feel free to visit my personal website at www.voicebard.com. Today, we have a very special guest, my dear friend, Paul Strickwitta. Paul is an award-winning producer, a Dutch English voiceover coach and artist with an extensive client list across every continent, from Discovery Channel and National Geographic to Priceline and Coca-Cola holding their utmost satisfaction as his best credential. Founder of NetherVoice.com and author of Building a Vocal Booth on a Budget and the phenomenal voiceover and solopreneur freelance guide, Making Money in Your PJs, Paul not only tells us how he got in the industry, but also the true mindset of a voiceover artist. Please help me give a warm welcome to Paul Strickwarda. How are you? Wonderful. How are you, Paul? Doing great. And by the way, I'm wearing my PJs, but you can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other half of my outfit. I always wear my fleece pants because that's my, that those pants don't make noise while I record. Those are my favorite. So I always feel like I am making money in my PJs. You know, I walk my talk. Man, I need to keep that in mind. Maybe I need to go buy a pair of fleece pants. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you take your coffee, Paul? I have a nice creamy froth. You know, my wife and I, a uh, couple of weeks ago, we got together and said, we want to drink less coffee, but better coffee. Mm -hmm. So we bought ourselves a Nespresso machine. Thank you, George Clooney, for promoting it. <laughs> and our life has been so much better. So we have one cup a day, and it came with an Errocino, which is basically a fancy word for frother. <laughs> so we have these nice, rich, delicate, wonderful, almost chocolatey type of cups of coffee. And then I add, sprinkle a little bit of um chocolate powder on top of it it's just wonderful man mm -hmm. man even, delicious even in the way that um you just described your cup of coffee the way that you storytell always comes from a place of imagination how um what what do you use to fuel that imagination when you use your storytelling behind the microphone well one of my trainers I, I, I took a lot of trainings in the United States uh, mm -hmm. in neurolinguistic psychology and in hypnosis and uh, presentation skills. And one of my trainers said, people will forget facts and information, but they will always remember how you made them feel, the emotion behind the facts. And how do you pass emotion on? Well, that's through storytelling, I think. And so I have a couple of things that are drawn. First of all, my life. I mean, I've been here for 58 years, so I've been through a lot. And since Holland, where I'm from, is a very small country, the Dutch love to travel. And 20 years ago, I still used to live in the Netherlands. And every uh, summer vacation, the Dutch have like six to eight weeks of summer vacation. We used to go abroad. So you meet people, you see things. And um, I draw upon those, those things. And I've also worked uh, in about five different countries for an extensive amount of time in, in, in different fields. So for me, that's a rich, rich feeding ground where I get those ideas. I read a lot. And most of the things that I read about have nothing to do with voiceovers. I know a lot of colleagues who do nothing but watch and listen to podcasts about voiceover and read voiceover books. Guilty as charged. <laughs> get discharged, <laughs> which is really great but you know i think that i learn most when i go outside of my field because that's where the real inspiration is for me so i read a lot of biographies from people that inspire me and a lot of personal growth and self-help books travel books books about life and um, also through friends of mine that go through things and a lot of people know me not through my voiceovers but really through my book and through the, the, the blog that I write every week on nethervoice.com. And to tell a secret, um, people think it's a book and it's a blog about voiceovers, but it's really not. I look at it as a blog about life through the lens of a voiceover artist. That's my prism through which I look at the world. 
And as a voiceover artist, we encounter all kinds of things that ordinary people, especially freelancers, go through as well. Take one thing, rejection, which is a big thing in all of our lives, you know, not only in our love life, but in our professional life as well. We hate to be rejected and we want to be accepted. So how do you deal with rejection? Um, job finding doesn't matter whether you're um, a, a photographer or a screenwriter or another freelancer. How do you find the jobs in this, this world where everybody is selling their wares online and saying, pick me, pick me? How do you make sure that you stand out? So that's not only something that voiceovers struggle with, but pretty much everybody who is an independent contractor. So I use that lens of uh, my life as a voiceover to look at my life and people's lives in general. And that's one of the comments that I often get that people say, you know, I started reading about it because I'm just interested in what you guys do as voiceovers and voice actors. And then I learned so much more about life and about um, what it is to be self-employed in these difficult times. And when people tell that, then I know my job is done. So you mentioned rejection, but um, I feel like that's a lens that um, I like to put over things because I don't mm -hmm. look at it from the viewpoint of rejection. I look at it as selection because right. you have to put your mind in the, the headspace of the producer. He's not sitting here going, oh, that was awful. I'm not going to use that. He has a job to fill and he has a role to do. So mm -hmm. his job is to select, not to reject. Exactly. So your job is to stand out enough for to be the one that he picks. Right. Now, my wife is a musician. Mm -hmm. uh, she teaches flute and piano, and she does a lot of auditions for orchestras that she wants to become a member of. And there's a big thing, be a difference between instrumentalists and vocalists. And I mm -hmm. see voiceovers as vocalists. Because mm -hmm. if you mess up an audition as an instrumentalist, you can always blame your trumpet or clarinet or flute. Because, well, you know, I didn't bring the right reed or my bow wasn't correct. You know, you can always blame it on the instrument. We are our instrument. So everything is personal. And that's why people tend to take things personally as well, even though it's not personal at all, because I got rejected because I wasn't a woman. I wasn't 25 years young or I had the wrong accent or I wasn't related to the person who hired the personnel for that particular job. You know, they're, it's so subjective. But it's, it's hard since our, our instrument is our voice, is us, to not take it personally. I think, you know, um, you're going to have a very big skin too in order to survive in this business. Mm -hmm. And you'll find out very quickly why you're not cut out for this. And I, I think this whole thing of people taking it personally is a big, big aspect in why people eventually get disenchanted with becoming a voiceover because they have all these dreams of what it's like. They think that voiceovers, you know, spend 80% of the time narrating the most fascinating material for a fascinating audience and they get all the accolades and prizes. prizes. But in, in truth, it's just really 80% finding the job and then 20% doing the job. One of my... my former partners was an air hostess and she was uh, really a, a visual artist. She was a wonderful painter but couldn't find a job as a painter. So she said, you know, what I love to do most than anything in the world is travel the world. So how can I make sure that I, without spending too much money, travel the world and see what this planet is all about? Let's become an air hostess. Great. Well, she forgot that 80% of being an air hostess is being a server in the air under terrible conditions with terrible people who are locked up and claustrophobic and treat you like dirt. And then 20% of the time was fun because you're in a nice hotel in a different location, but forget about the time difference and, and the jet lag that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I think being a voiceover is a little bit like that. People have this romantic idea of what it is like, and it is phenomenal. I wouldn't change it for anything in the world, but they forget that 80% is really the hard work and the nitty gritty stuff. That's really quite boring. And rejection is part of that too. Right. So going back to music, you started in musicology, correct? Mm -hmm. So what oh, yes. lured you to want to be behind the microphone or were <laughs> your studies in musicology related? <laughs> I, um, I started in radio by accident. It was kind of a joke. When okay. I started studying musicology, I was part of a group of friends. And one of my best friends, her uncle was a news anchor at a Dutch 
radio station. And he mm -hmm. said, my radio station is inviting young people to make radio shows for a very young teenage audience, and we're looking for talent. And I was studying musicology at that time, and the question is, what does a musicologist do, you know? I mean, a flutist plays the flute and makes recordings and becomes world famous, but have you ever heard of a famous musicologist? I hadn't. They write stuffy <laughs> books that nobody reads, right? But one part that a musicologist can find employment in is as a radio host on classical music stations. So I had that in mind. So I said, you know, what if I take that uncle of that friend of mine who works in radio up on his offer and start making youth radio programs? Who knows, I can phase in and start as a, as a presenter of classical music programs. And uh, that's really the first time that I got to see a studio from the inside. And it was a phenomenal program because what they did is they let you get trained by the best in the business because they didn't just want to throw you for the wolves and say, here's a microphone. Now start talking and make radio that kids will like. No, no, no. You got a very thorough training. It was all for free. I mean, they didn't pay me for what I was doing either. So it was a nice win-win situation. But I got a great education. And within a year, they looked at me and listened to me and said, hey, this guy has some talent. And I got an offer to start presenting programs for real with real people for real money. And I got hooked and I stayed hooked ever since. And that was the first 24 years of my career. I became a news anchor. Eventually, I worked for Radio Netherlands International, the Dutch World Service, now defunct. And I got a chance for a year to go to London and work my dream job to work at the BBC, which is phenomenal. I worked for the religious department. That's a very different story, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm telling you, that was a dream come true, working for the BBC and getting to meet the people that I would listen to all the time, really my, my idols, and see how radio was made the way I wanted to be made. It's phenomenal. Fascinating. Man. Mm -hmm. So with you spending so much time in audio, um, a personal issue that I have is because I listen to audio all day and I listen to music all day and um, that, that's what I surround myself with. Um, I can't unhear things. So I'll listen to the radio and I'll just pick up on mouth clicks that people wouldn't normally hear. Um, I, I kind of tune into those breaths. Uh, how, how do you turn that off? <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could. Because <laughs> um, uh, it's, I, I call it like uh, professional deformation okay. to get back to the, the, the music. You know, um, I eventually spent more time in, at the radio station than I was uh, uh, studying musicology. So I said goodbye to, um, to University in Utrecht and became a full-time radio person. But I was still friends with my musicology and uh, musician friends. And when we went to concerts together, it was a grueling experience for them because I was sitting next to them and said, you know what? I'm going to sit back, relax, and enjoy the great symphony orchestra that I'm listening to now. And all they could hear was the mistakes that were made and the interpretation that they didn't agree with. And they had a horrific time. They were criticizing all the time. I said, I never want to become like that person. I want to keep on enjoying the music. I'm not going to be in a critic all the time. And look what happened to me now. I'm exactly like you, and I'm my own worst critic. And on top of that, I suffer from something called misophonia, which literally means the hate of noise, the hate of sound. Right. You, just wrote, of a, you wrote an article on it. In I did, voice, yes. It's you? kind of an unrecognized affliction. It's not um, uh, researched very much. But it's really people who get set off by everyday noises, like... Uh, Mouth clicks, you know, lip smacks, heavy breathing, but also eating noises. And it, uh, anything can really set you off. Different things for different people. But for instance, when I sit next to my poor wife and we eat together, I have to have the music on or something else to distract me from her mouth noises. The same with friends. And it's really a trigger that sets off a very terrible reaction. I get very angry and upset inside. And I know that some people who suffer from it severely have become very antisocial, can't even stay in the same room when their family is eating. So imagine those nasty, tiny little sounds setting you off all the time when you have to edit your own material. It's really my worst nightmare. And they haven't found any therapy yet uh, that is really effective, let alone medication. It's really 
distraction, you know, think about something else, have music in the background, which I cannot do when I'm editing my own stuff. But it's it's right. really annoying. And it, I never suffered from it until I had my stroke two years ago. And that's, I think it's a side effect of my stroke because that did something to my brain. You know, I hate to tell it, but I'm working on half a brain here. <laughs> the rest I lost during my stroke. But that's something that I that I suffered started suffering from after my stroke, just like my glasses. I never had to use glasses, but after my stroke, I needed to get them. Yep. So, well, here's, that's, uh, here's to suffering in silence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we sit in padded booths all day, just muttering other people's words. I think um, all voiceover artists are running a little insane these days. I know normally you have to commit a terrible crime to sit in this seven by seven enclosure with the door closed. Right. We, <laughs> we do it just for fun, right? Right. So um, what, what lured you to come over to the United States? Um, from Europe. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sounds like you're having a wonderful time in the Netherlands and I know oh, yeah. how much you miss Holland and work, oh my gosh, yes. working for I'm BBC. So so what brought you over here? <laughs> the longer I'm away from the Netherlands, the more I miss it. And sometimes I cannot I cannot um, imagine whatever got me to the United States. And then I look into the eyes of my wife and I know <laughs> it's love. Simple, simply put, it's love. I fell in love with somebody from the United States and she is the reason that I'm still here, to be frank. She is my night and my day and she rescued my life and she's the sunshine and my sundown and the most beautiful person that I know. And that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> you know, I, I thought that I would end up in the UK cause I'm an Anglophile. When I grew up, I, uh, I love British literature. I love British sitcom. I'm a big Monty Python fan and yeah. Blackadder and all those shows. You know, I still watch a lot of BBC. And I thought, you know, when I when I worked for the BBC, I actually applied for a job there and I got hired. <laughs> and then they they had some inner changes and that ended up me going back to Holland. But that that's where I thought my future would be in the United Kingdom. Never in the United States. But life works in mysterious ways, including love. You can't fight love, Andrew. You cannot fight love, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So um, was it when you started here that you started doing stuff with Edge Studios, or was that um, did you build that relationship beforehand? No, I had never heard of Edge Studios. I, 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 I came here and started doing trainings in personal growth and development because that's another part of my background. I'm a mm -hmm. international cert trainer, uh, certified trainer of NLP and hypnotherapy. And that was what first also got me to the United States, an opportunity to train people in those areas. And um, I really missed working the microphone, working in radio and using my voice in that way. So one day I um, saw an ad in the paper of Philadelphia where there was an open casting call for Mike Lemon casting in Philadelphia. And Mike Lemon is the guy who does all the casting for M. Night Shyamalan. Okay. He's the guy who, uh, who made, uh, what's that movie where Haley Joel Osment said, I see dead people. What's that movie again? Um, um, with Bruce Willis. Right. You know, it's a very famous movie. Right. Anyway, Mike Lemon did all the casting for that. So he was a big name, never heard of him, but, um, I said, you know, why not give it a try? And before I know it, I, it was a Wednesday afternoon. I went to a cattle call, literally 400 people in a very cramped space. And there, were all, there was only one person doing voiceover auditions, and that was me. And uh, I did my thing, and uh, Mike Lemon um, recorded everything and said, you know what? Uh, I think we're done here. I want you to meet uh, our voiceover director. And that's how I met Joanne Joella who was uh, in charge of the voiceovers. And we had a terrific afternoon together. And that was the beginning of something beautiful. <laughs> and the beginning of my official voiceover career in the United States, that was in the year 2000. And I thought it was something fun to do on the side, you know, and while I was training other people in personal growth and development. But look at me now, <laughs> you're interviewing me because Obviously, it's become my main source of income and my main source of professional joy and pride. Right. 
So I mean, but you're asking about the Edge Studio, and I have to apologize for me getting off on tangent. You are perfectly fine. But that's that sort of oh, life, right? Great. <laughs> you think you go in one direction, and there's oh look, scroll, and you go off there and off there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, the Edge Studio got in touch with me because of my blog. I I love writing because I I have this whole creative part of me that does not get fulfilled in doing voiceovers because I think one part of voiceovers is not very creative because we're always asked to read other people's texts. You know, we never get to be creative ourselves apart from interpreting that text and and Mm -hmm. diving into different roles and being different characters. But it's very much saying words that we would never say, talking about things that we would never talk about and doing things that we would never do in real life and pretend that it's all spontaneous. But um, I started writing about it because I felt that through my experience, people could benefit from what I l- learned as a European talent in the United States. And because um, I have this, this, this kind of um, unfiltered way of looking at the world that people think is very Dutch, and they call it the Dutch directness. The Dutch do not beat about the bush. They always tell you exactly what they mean, and they don't sugarcoat it. And I... I sometimes come across as very blunt. People have to get used to my way of putting things, especially in the beginning. But then they appreciate it, that I'm very direct. You always know what you see is what you get and what you hear is what you get. And apparently pick, people picked up on that when they started reading my blog. And it snowballed into something that I never thought would be possible because from 100 subscribers, I got to 1,000 and eventually to 10,000. And now I have over 40,000 subscribers to my blog. And I don't think there are any other bloggers in the voiceover universe that have as many subscribers as I have. Whoa, look, look at me. But I'm really proud of that accomplishment. And um, because of that, um, the Edge Studio got wind of me. And um, I said, you know, um, with your background coming from Europe and you have this special accent that's the neutral English accent, um, we don't have that yet uh, as in as, as our offers the, our offering of trainers. What do you think? Would you like to become a trainer for us and train people in the international art of doing voiceovers? It's like uh, Austin Powers, like the international man of mysteries, you know, <laughs> the international man of voiceovers. And I said, yes, let's do it for a little bit. And I did that for about two years. And then we went our separate ways. But I still really have a really good um, memory of working with the Edge Studio and David Goldberg in particular, he's a terrific guy. I got to know him uh, at various conferences and we're still very friendly with one another. And uh, still when people ask me, you know, um, where should I start studying? Uh, do you, is there somebody that you recommend I should record demos with? I always mention the Edge Studio as one of their options because they offer really high quality training. They have a great outfit now. They opened it a couple of years ago in New York, completely renewed and phenomenal studios. And um, the nice thing is that they they still book me for work as well, because what many people don't know is it's not only a training organization, but they also do recordings, voiceover recordings for different clients all over the world. So whenever they need somebody with a, a Dutch accent or an, a strange English accent, they, they think of me and I really appreciate that. I hope you enjoyed learning about how Paul made his way from the Netherlands to America and found his inspiration in the world of voiceover. In our next episode, we talk to Paul about presenting the value of yourself as a voiceover artist and being a magnet for your next client. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.